and could do in one sitting. So we are going to get to Greg's carpet today. Uh, obviously, uh, this is like a two day recording. I'm hoping to have this out by three o'clock. That's my goal. So I can enjoy the fucking weekend. Uh, but this, this segment is going to be a bit all over the place. And the reason why I say that is because when Greg Scarpa first becomes an informant, uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, usually there's an ebb and flow to a 302. So maybe I need to open by explaining how this kind of works. Uh, anytime you have a 302, when a guy decides to become an informant, typically what you see in 302s, and it, it's different for every case. So anybody that's familiar with how this process works could say to me, well, but it's not always that way. And they would be right. It's not always this way. But typically what you see in a 302, uh, depending on high, what kind of high level informant you have, uh, what, what information you have, there's sort of an ebb and flow and what I like to call a milking. It's a gross... <laughs> description uh but there's like a milking going on and it basically the informant is testing the fbi the fbi is testing the informant and usually they don't come out of the gate with a whole lot they start very very slow uh because at the end of the day the better the information the more money they get and in this particular situation uh this is sort of a spoil alert uh, as far as greg scarpa goes but a lot of people have always thought that Greg Scarpa was this incredible earner. He was a prolific hitman. I don't, th I don't think anybody's going to tell you any different, and I'm not going to bullshit you either. He was a dangerous fucking guy for a lot of reasons. But what you're going to find out, and I don't know if we'll get there today, but you're going to find out that this was a money grab by Greg Scarpa. That's, that's all it was. Now, when you open the 302s and you look at them, you have to say to yourself, how accurate is the information? Because the FBI is always going to try to go to third and fourth hand sources to try to back it up to make sure it's true. Now, just in the the 35 or uh, so pages, you can kind of see where it, he gives a lot of information from the very beginning. But his reason for giving the information is a little different than what most informants have done throughout history. Usually informants are giving information because they want to get out of jail or they want to get out of their sentence or they want to get out of their charges. Uh, Greg Scarpa was doing this for a money grab because Greg Scarpa knew that the more money that he got from the feds, the higher in rank he could actually go. And you're going to find out today when we go through some of this paperwork that that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, it, it had nothing to do with he was angry at people, had nothing to do with he didn't want to go to jail. It had everything to do with he needed to find a way to become an earner because he had no other way of doing it. And this is the route that he chose. So we're going to go through uh, some of this today. And there's some stuff that's just absolutely ludicrous. I'm going to try to get through at least 20 pages of this. And we'll continue next week with the rest of it. Uh, but here's a couple of things. First of all, just as a background information, you have to understand that Greg Scarpa was not made until 1959-ish, 1960. Okay, he was not officially a captain within the crime family until 1977. So he had a, a 15 to 20 year run before he ever became a captain. But what you're going to find out is he lied to the FBI about his rank. Uh, and you're going to see how much money they were paying him and some of the things he says to try to get more money out of them so that the more money he brings in, the more important he becomes within the organization itself. So the first letter, and, and he started talking to the FBI like in 1959, 1960, but officially uh, is not considered a top echelon informant until March 28th of 1962. That's when officially uh, the government signed a deal with him. So, uh, this says 328, uh, 1962 referenced letter sets forth significant information obtained from Gregory Scarpa recording, uh, regarding, well, they called him informant, but we know who he is regarding the gangland strife between Joe Profaci and the Gallo brothers advised the Bureau of this informant has reported that he is a member of either the Profaci or Gallo organization. Uh, in the event, this informant has not been specifically asked if you were a member of an Italian organization, you should promptly do so. And then there's a note, the reference letter to the New York office designated this individual 
an informant in connection with the top echelon criminal informant program. The source has provided keen insight into the gang warfare between the Profaci group and the Gallo group. New York instruct, instructed to advise if informant admits to being a member of any Italian organization, which we know that Greg Scarpa is going to do, and it's signed by everybody, the case agents and, and everybody else. Uh, and uh, like I said, March 29th of 1962 it was actually filed so the actual mail date is february excuse me march 28th of 1962 all right so right out of the gate there really isn't sort of an ebb and flow and whereas most people uh, most informants when you look at their 302s they start very slow greg scarpa didn't he came right out of the gate uh, this informant stated that Lo Cicero was reportedly going to contact Larry Gallo or had contacted him regarding a peace movement between the Gallo and Profaci factions of the Profaci crime family. Informant stated that he did not know whether these actions by Lo Cicero had the support of Joe Profaci or whether Lo, Rici Lo, Rici Lo Cicero was doing this on his own. Uh, so here's the thing. You have to understand something. If you're keep in mind we'll get to the part where he tells them that he's a captain within the crime family if he's a captain he would have known these things for certain everything that's done is coming from the boss uh there's not going to be a movement from anybody else there was a beef between profaci and the gallows we've all known that because we've talked about um the crime history with the with the gallows and the profaci's and the colombo so we've talked about how all that went down so hopefully all of you have retained some of that information uh, because these orders wouldn't have come down from anybody else but Joe Profaci. He goes on to say he stated that he did not believe that any peace overtures would be accepted because he felt that the matter had gotten too far out of control and it had to be settled through negotiations. 1-9-1962, informant advised the Gallo organization had turned Charles Lo Cicero down on his peace offer, which he, Lo Cicero, had made. And this is accurate. Lo Cicero was the go between Profaci and Gallo, and he's the guy that sat down and tried to mitigate what the beef was. So that part of what Greg Scarpa is saying is accurate, but it wouldn't have been something that Lo Cicero did on his own without Profaci knowing. It just never would have happened that way. Um, let's see. Informant stated that. The Gallows refused to accept the offer made by Lo Cicero. Things have reverted back to the same old status, and it appears only the only solution would be the elimination of the Gallows. Informant stated that it was his understanding that prior to 12-31-1961, a member of members of the Profaci organization was assigned to set up individual number of hits on members of the Gallo organization. He stated that, to the best of his knowledge, all those assignments were being worked on actively uh and that about the end of december of 1961 all of those who were assigned hits were told to stop their work along those lines he stated that it was about this time that he heard that charles lo cicero had contacted larry gallo in an attempt to bring peace again to the two organizations and that larry gallo had turned down lo cicero's offer again he stated that some of the members of the Profaci organization, including Lo Cicero, apparently feel that they must avoid open warfare between the two groups, as such warfare would only bring additional police pressure to Brooklyn. I don't think there's anything wrong with that statement. I mean, I think that's the right pulse. I think that's what was going on. Uh, informant advised that since a peace offer has been turned down, he heard that certain contracts were given out to some members of the Gal organization again. So once again, no peace. Let's kill him. Uh, informant stated that when a member of the organization receives an order, they must carry it out regardless of their personal feelings and have no alternative but to carry out that order. He stated that the gallows were made approximately five years ago and that after being made, they were of the opinion that they would come into sudden wealth. Uh, informants related to this said it, it wasn't true and that the gallows soon found out that most of their rackets such as the numbers garbage collection etc were already under the control of somebody else and the gallows were not allowed to move in on anyone else's operations he stated that through the years there was friction over various things and that the gallows attempted to get into that and he felt that the final blow up was an accumulation of various things rather than any one particular thing and once again we see greg scarpa here is is right on the money now some of you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, but Jeff, you always say rats lie. Well, they do lie. They, they lie consistently. But this is something that he needed to provide to them to give them the foundation of information. If he can give accurate 
summations of what he believes is going on and the FBI can check all of their sources and it all kind of checks out then he's 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 sort of pulling and lulling the FBI into his trap because now he knows all right they're going to check they're going to find out I'm probably accurate but there's one question you have to ask yourself if Greg Scarpa was telling them all of this why didn't the cops move in why didn't the feds move in on the gallows and the simple answer to that is because they wanted it to escalate because all of the he said, she said, that's fine and dandy, but they wanted it to escalate because once it escalates, now they have them on serious charges. And that's what the FBI has been known to do. I hate to tell you that, but that's just the truth. Uh, informant stated that there has been meetings held at the Golden Door restaurant at Idlewild Airport in an effort to settle the issue with the gallows before all of the trouble began. He stated that he attended two of those meetings but refused to attend any more due to the conduct of Joey Gallo. That I don't believe is true. Uh, Greg Scarpa was just a measly soldier in those days. He was not a captain within the crime family. He did not become a captain until 1977. So therefore, he would not have been at that meeting because if Lo Cicero was there, they would not have sent Greg Scarpa. He was a soldier. There's just no way physically possible that they would have sent him there. But that's him inserting himself into something to sort of try to prove that that actually happened. Uh, he stated that the gallows first left the organization and that some of the organization's men went with them. According to the informant, Carmine Persico originally went with the gallows and he had approached the informant in an effort to persuade him to join with the gallows. The informant stated that he knew the gallows were crazy and, wanted, and, and nothing but trouble could come from them and come from joining their crew. Therefore, he would not consider leaving the organization to associate with the Gallo group. He stated that all of the organization's men who originally went with the Gallows are either dead or have returned to the organization. In this light, he stated that Joe Jelly is one of the ones considered dead. And he's right. Joe Jelly was killed. However, once again, I have a hard time believing that Carmine Persico asked Greg Scarpa, a measly soldier at that point, to leave the organization. It could have happened. Uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to me. I just don't believe it. I just don't think that that's, um, you know, because you got to understand up until this point, Greg Scarpa had really just been made within, what, two or three years. He had just been made. Uh, so uh, 12961 informant advised that he heard from various members of the Profaci organization that on 12561, the order came down for all members who were working on efforts to line up the members of the Gallo mob for assassination, they needed to stop. Informant stated that he did not know the reason for this order, but that all the individuals known to him who had work to do along those lines had been ordered to cease. He stated that he did not know if there was a peace movement underway or what the reason was given for those orders, um, and that he was in a position to ask questions. So, if he's not in a position to ask questions about what's going on, what in the fuck makes you think that he was in a position to go to a high-level sit-down between Lo Cicero, who at the time was basically the number two of the Provacis, to meet with Joey Gallo? <laughs> Did you see the hypocrisy in kind of what he's saying? All right, so 11 1361, the informant advised that the Gallo brothers were originally brought around and introduced by Johnny Scamini. He stated that some of his people, whom he did not know by, the, by name, began making good money off the Gallo operations and were pushing them hard in the organization. Informant stated that Charles Lo Cicero was opposed to the Gallos in the very beginning, stating that the Gallos were not the right kind of people. Informant stated that the politics entered into the matter. Lo Cicero was persuaded to keep quiet and just following... And that following this, the gallows were officially made. The gallows were actually officially made in 1957 after the murder of Albert Anastasia, which they took a part in. That's what got them their buttons. Uh, informant advised that after they were made, they began to run wild and push for more and more authority within the organization. He related that the same result, uh, or as a result of this, the decision was made to dispose of them. <laughs> Uh, in explaining why did they use a rope in an effort to strangle Larry Gallo, informant stated that there were several men who had to go, uh, and that with the heat that is being put on New York City by the Attorney General, it was felt that if that it would not be a good idea to gun them down and leave bodies laying all over the streets in Brooklyn. He stated that the plan was to just have them disappear and never be seen again. He stated that that it was. He stated that it was his thought that it would be illogical 
as they were all out on bail and it would be felt by the authorities that they were jumping bail. Uh, Informant stated that on Sunday when the attempt was made on Larry Gallo, three of the men in the Sahara Lounge at the time were to disappear and indicated that the other two, in addition to Larry Gallo, were Johnny Scamini and Anthony Abadamarco. He related that if the plans had worked, these three would have been successfully taken care of. A cell would have been made uh, to Joey Gallo. Gallo would have been told to come down for a powwow and that his brother was actually that his brother would be there and that Joe Gallo would have been disposed of the second he came through the door. On 11 28 61, the informant furnished the following information concerning the Gallo group. So this is New York file 92676. It's Joseph Profacci, uh, Lawrence Gallo, aka AR, New York file 92 1610. Informant stated, excuse me, that with regard to the shooting of Joe Manasco, that he was not present, nor was he in the planning of the shooting, but heard that the shooting was actually an attempt to kill Joey Gallo. He stated that it was his understanding that Gallo was in the car when he arrived at the restaurant. When Joe got out of the car, instead of going to the restaurant, he walked across the street to greet an acquaintance. Uh, And Manasco went into the restaurant. He stated that the group who was there to do the shooting entered the restaurant had the gun exposed before they found out that Joey Gallo was not actually in the restaurant. He stated that since the gun was exposed, they decided to go ahead and kill Manasco anyway. With regard to this, the shooting in the connection with Harry Fontana, he stated that the relative, a relative of Fontana's, uh, and this is redacted, so I don't know what it says, uh, but he did not believe any of Fontana's relatives had nerve enough to ever use a gun in that manner, uh, which it was used in the killing of McNasco. Uh, he advised that in connection with the Profaci and Gallo warfare, he stated that it was his opinion that the whole matter had gone too far uh, for there ever to be reconciliation. He stated he believed that the Profaci organization had too much support, too much power, and he believes that it was just a matter of time until the Gallos were broken. He stated that the only way that they will be broken is by killing them. So now we move to a memorandum. Uh, This is from the director of the FBI to the SAC New York, top echelon criminal informant program, dated 4-3-1962, Rublet to New York City, dated 3-28-62. When informant originally agreed, okay, now this is important. This is what I want you to to pay attention to. When informant originally agreed to furnish information uh, to the contacting agents, it was because of a personal liking for the agent's and faith in their discretion in handling information furnished by Gregory Scarpa. Informant indicated that at the time he desired to furnish information concerning TFIS violations, only which he knew were investigated by the contacting agents. So, one of the interesting things that happened with Greg Scarpa is once he became an informant, he was only an informant in Brooklyn, meaning he wanted to make sure that no matter what happened, he always dealt with the same handlers and he was only dealt with in the same area. It meant that FBI agents from Manhattan or Queens could not even talk to him, couldn't come near him. And that's a way to protect himself from ever being found out that he's a rat. But this is what I find amusing. When informant originally agreed to furnish information to the contacting agents, it was only because of his personal liking for the agents and faith in their discretion in handling information. It doesn't say that he was disenfranchised with the mob. He was fearing for his life. He just liked the fucking cops. Uh, Let's see. The informant has indicated he has an extreme reluctance to discuss matters relating to organized crime, but will. It has only been through the patience and persistence of the contacting agents that information concerning organized crime has been received from this informant. However, through repeated, long, and carefully planned contacts, the informant's trust in the agents has increased to the point that he is now furnishing unbelievable, accurate, and detailed information concerning the strife between the Profaci and Gallo groups in Brooklyn, New York. As the Bureau is aware, the rules of the criminal organization prohibit members from admitting membership within. Members are reluctant to make disclosures concerning the organization for fear of retaliation against themselves and their families. Therefore, the contacting agents have not made direct inquiries of the informant concerning his standing or membership in the organization. But that's what, so in other words, the agents don't want to know what rank he is, what he's doing. They just want information on everybody else. But the problem is 
not like two months later, and you'll find out they he had already told them what he was. The contacting agents do not feel this informant has developed to the point where it would be wise to make direct inquiry concerning his membership in a criminal organization. So if he's not a member of a criminal organization, this, this information just fell out of the fucking sky? <laughs> it's just stupid when I read these things. Um However, the contacting agents believe that he is a member due to the following information which has been received from him. This informant has been closely associated with Charles Lo Cicero, a top hoodlum in Brooklyn, uh, during Greg Scarpa's adult life. He has indicated that he is completely loyal to Lo Cicero and would be willing to accept any orders or requests made by, to him by Lo Cicero, but he has no problem ratting him out. <laughs> From a high level of information furnished by the informant, it is apparent that this informant is trusted by Lo Cicero, which would, which would not be true if he were not a member of the organization. Informant has indicated that his sympathies lie with Lo Cicero and through him to the Profaci group in the current struggle for power between Profaci and the Gallo group. Informant has indicated that if as a result of Lo Cicero's efforts to mediate the dispute between the Gallo and Profaci groups, Profaci retaliated against Lo Cicero, the informant would then favor the Gallo group. So everything he said uh, on the last page about how he wanted nothing to do with the Gallos, they were all crazy. Oh, well, if Lo Cicero gets punished for some reason, then I'm going right to the Gallos. So he's really not loyal to fucking anybody but himself. Let's just be honest about it. Uh, the informant has been, let's see, okay, we read that. It is the, the opinion of the contacting agents based on this above information that the informant is a member or a made member of the Profaci crime family. No direct inquiry will be made of the informant at this time concerning his membership in the organization as we feel uh, it is not pertinent to the information we are receiving. Well, I'm sorry, but I think it is. <laughs> if I'm telling you I know all this shit and then I'm like, oh, but I'm not involved. You have to... In these type of days, the FBI didn't give a shit. They just wanted the information. You know, it didn't matter to them. I mean, they're not even trying to corroborate anything. They're just taking his fucking word for it. Summary of information furnished since conversion. Lawrence Albert Gallo, a.k.a. AK, file 92-1610, Joe Profaci, also known as AR, uh, New York file 92-676. On March 20th of 1962, Greg Scarpa advised that he had heard that uh, there was an moratorium on violence which had which had been in existence since Profaci and the groups uh, agreed to during negotiations to reach a peace agreement. Uh, it had been extended for only a two-week period. He stated that according to the story that he heard, Larry Gallo went to the home of Charles Lo Cicero on Sunday, March 18th of 1962, and he advised Lo Cicero that Lo Cicero would be would have until 6 p.m. Monday, March 19th, 1962, to advise his members uh, of that the moratorium was off as of 6 p.m. on Monday. Both groups would be free to take any action against the other group. There's a problem with this statement. And the problem with this statement is that four pages ago, he said on this exact date that they met near at the Golden Turd, whatever the restaurant was, and Idlewild. So he's already changed his story. Uh, just flipping through two pages, you see how the story changes. Not that the location matters, but on one page, he puts himself there at the meeting. On this page, he's saying, no, he just heard that there was a meeting at Lord Cicero's house. So it's the same exact date. The same exact date. How can you be in two places on the same time, same fucking day, different people there? I mean, either the FBI is retarded and they can't discern what they're writing. Uh, it's goofy shit. Later on March 20th of 1962, the informant stated that it was his understanding that the moratorium on violence between Gallo and Profaci groups was still in effect and would remain in effect till 6 o'clock. April 2nd of 1962, he stated that he heard from individuals closely associated with Charles Lo Cicero that an individual by the name of Lawrence who operates a barber supply business in the vicinity of the Gallo's headquarters, was acting as a messenger or a go-between the Gallo's and Lo Cicero. He stated that this individual, according to his information, is a very old man and is completely gray. Informant related that he had heard that this individual related 
or excuse me, visited Lo Cicero at Lo Cicero's home during the afternoon of March 20th of 62. Informants stated that according to talk by individuals closely associated with Lo Cicero, Lo Cicero is still endeavoring to get Joe Profacci to step down as the head of the Brooklyn organization. That is absolutely unequivocally not true. On April 4th of 62, informant advised that he learned a meeting was held at the home of Charles Lo Cicero. So once again, like he just keeps changing the fucking story over and over again uh, concerning Gallo. Uh, the, so this meeting was held at the, once again, the home of Charles Lo Cicero. Informant learned that at this meeting, it was decided that Joe Profacci is not going to step down as leader of the Brooklyn organization. Informant also learned that an ultimatum consisting of three points were issued to the Gallo faction. You guys are going to love these, these points. Point number one. The Gallows were to stay out of the or were to stay out of the organization and were to remain peaceful. Number two, the Gallows can come back into the Profaci organization with a guarantee from the organization that the lives of the Gallows uh, would be okay, but not for any of their men. So, in other words, they want to come back to the Profacis. It's okay. The Gallows won't be touched, but your men, we're not going to say that we're not going to. Uh, hurt them number three is the biggest lie i've ever heard in my life and you guys would know because this is absolutely true number three if the gallows commit any acts of violence the profaci group will immediately retaliate not only against the gallows but their men and also their wives and children that's bullshit complete and utter bullshit that's never happened in the history of the mafia it's not to say that a threat wasn't issued but that's just not what they do. Uh, and listen, Joe Profaci was not a fucking nut. He was a very shrewd guy. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Joe Profaci just because of his penny-pinching ways and the way he treated his men. But he was definitely not insane enough to, to order a death threat to somebody's children. Uh, because I'm going to tell you, if that was the order that came down and that was told to the Gallows, do you really think that Joey Gallo wouldn't have then wanted to sit down with the commission and say to them, well he's threatening to kill my children. That would have been a huge problem. That's why I don't believe it ever happened. On April 9th of 1962, and this file is 92, 2300. On April 9th of 62, informant stated that it was his understanding of the commission. That, and this is, remember when I told you guys that you guys all thought that Joe Valachi was the turd in the punch bowl? Okay, and, and a lot of people argue, well, if Joe Bonato never read that, wrote that book, they wouldn't know of the commission. Well, they knew about the commission prior. They just couldn't prove it. It was Joe Bonato who sort of lined out how that kind of worked. But it turns out they already knew that because this memo was about to explain it. On April 9th, the 62 informant stated that it was his understanding the commission consisted of all top level individuals in the organization, such as Joe Profaci. He stated that all of these individuals hold equal rank and are considered uh, commission men. He stated that the organization has such men covering the entire United States. He stated that there is one in Florida, one in Arizona, one in Nevada, one in California, who he stated was a highly reputable criminal lawyer on the West Coast, one in Pennsylvania, one in Detroit, one in Boston, one in Providence, uh, one in Chicago, uh, and five in New York City. He stated to the FBI that the five commission men in New York were Joe Profaci, Tommy Lucchese, Carlo Gambito, Vito Genovese, but he says there's a fifth one that he can't remember, and we know that to be Joe Bonanno. Now, why he can remember uh, everybody else but not Joe Bonanno is a little suspect to me, to be honest with you, uh, especially since you know everything else. Uh, so he goes on and says, uh, it says the informant gave the following explanation to how the commission operates. So once again, I'm going to go back to something that I've said repeatedly. The idea, this is what, 1961, 1962. So they knew about the commission. They couldn't prove the existence. But once again, Greg Scarp has given them everything. And I'll go back to the Rudy Giuliani, Joe Bonanno thing. They knew that a commission existed. They didn't understand, albeit according to the government in the 80s for the commission case, <coughs> they explained that they totally didn't understand how it functioned in capacity until Joe Bonanno sort of dotted the lines. And so I wonder 
And this may be the logical case that these files were sealed for a long time. Maybe Giuliani didn't have access to them. That could be very plausible in this certain case. But the idea that the government had no clue is bullshit. They did. And this is why I argue with people when they say, you're talking about something that's secret. No, I'm really not. (laughs) Since 1889, 1890, they knew that organized crime existed. J. Edgar Hoover knew organized crime existed. And he tried to protect the mob as best he could until Appalachian. Once that happens, he can't he can no longer ignore the pink elephant sitting in the corner farting and eating corn dogs. Uh, so it's just um, this is what he says. Uh, Greg Scarpa states that the problem. OK, hold on. The informant gave the following explanation to how the commission presently operates. Keep in mind, this is file ninety two twenty three hundred from 1962. This is before Valachi ever turns rat. He stated that when a problem comes up, that it has to be referred to the entire commission. A delegation of two or three men is appointed who will go around the country and contact all the other commission men. He stated that following these contacts, an agreement is reached on a number of individuals ranging from three up who are named as the commission for this particular problem. He stated that these individuals for the particular problem will then meet to hear the evidence presented by both sides of the dispute. He stated that following that hearing, the group that has been appointed by the commission to act as the commission for the particular dispute will hand down a ruling, which is then binding on the entire organization. Greg Scarpa explained that prior to the Appalachian meeting, all the commission men would get together for meetings on big issues. He stated that since they were caught at Appalachian, they no longer hold these large meetings. We know that not to be true. Uh, he explained that all the men at Appalachian were not commission members in so much as the commission man is allowed to make one or more of his lieutenants with him, take one of his lieutenants with him to a commission meeting. That is actually accurate. In regard to the Profaci organization, the informant stated that he would estimate that there are, you're going to love this, there are approximately 400 made men in the Profaci crime family at the present time. He stated that the Profaci organization consisted of approximately 200 men up until the time that Albert Anastasia started increasing the number of men in his operation and organization. At this time, according to the informant, Profaci made an additional 200 men, which brought the number up to 200. So what we see is competition. Albert Anastasia starts to refresh the ranks, bringing a lot of people, making his family powerful. So now Profaci tries to do the right, uh, almost the same thing. He stated that Carlo Gambino reportedly has a thousand men in his organization. One thousand men. And that's probably close to reality. I got to be honest with you. That is a, a lot of people. The informant advised that if the commission man dies or is arrested and given prison or a prison term, the men in his organization then get together and recommend a replacement for him. Uh, The name of this replacement is then submitted to the commission, and if approved by the commission, then he assumes the rank of a commission member. He stated that this person will serve until the original commission member whose place he took is released from prison, or, or, or at which time the original commission member automatically takes over his position again. Carlo Gambino, a.k.a. AR, New York File 92657. April 17, 1962, the informant stated that the organization is now headed by Gambino, which was formerly Charles Lucky Luciano, which is uh, very interesting because depending on how you want to read this, uh, he's saying in 1962 that the organization, he's talking about the entire mafia. He's saying that Carlo Gambino basically is the boss of bosses. Uh, the informant, okay. Um, and so it just, I'm going to stop right there with that because it, it, it's, once again, we see he's giving somewhat accurate information. But there's a lot of stuff that when you go through this is inaccurate. Um, so there's a teletype that's on page three of this. This informant would be receptive to any inquiries, the possibility of such inquiry could alienate the trust which has been established by the contacting agent and that outweighs the possible value of any inquiries. The Bureau will be advised 
of the progress and the development of this informant and as much time as the contacting agents feel he would be receptive, inquiry would be made concerning his membership in the organization. All right, so now we're going to move on to a couple other things. Uh, he's saying that Luciano's organization and the following of his deportation, Albert Anastasia became the head of that organization. Then following the death of Anastasia, Carlo Gambino became the head of the organization, and he stated that this organization is the largest in the New York City area. Uh, you know, there could be some arguments that when Luciano was deported, uh, Albert Anastasia was not the boss of bosses. That was actually Frank Costello. Uh, he was the head of everything. Uh, so, it, you know, and then you had the, the Vito Genovese bullshit. So I, I, you know, maybe he's speaking in terms of relatively speaking, Anastasia had the most power, uh, but that's really not the case. He might've had the most power, the most men, the most bloodshed, uh, but I just don't see it uh, sort of that way. All right, the commission, New York file 922300. On April 17th of 1962, additional discussions were had with Greg Scarpa concerning information furnished by him regarding of the commission. Informant stated that the commission consists of all heads of the five families throughout the United States and stated that each organization, such as Joe Profacci's, is known as a crime family. He stated that this is true because when an individual is accepted into membership, he becomes a brother to all the members. He stated that all heads of the five families hold equal rank within the organization, regardless of the size of their family or the area in which they control. He stated that the commission is set up only to handle disputes between the families or when a dispute within the family cannot be netted by the family, settled by the family and begins to disrupt the operation of that family. According to Greg Scarpa, it is not too easy to get members to sit on the commission now due to the pressure from law enforcement and the large amount of publicity afforded the organizations following the Appalachian meeting. The informant related that it is his understanding that when a dispute arises between two groups, which requires a calling of the commission meeting, one party to the dispute will approach the commission, uh, a commission man who is not associated with either one of the two groups involved in the dispute and requests him to organize a, a commission meeting to handle the dispute. Uh, he stated, as an example of this was Profaci joe Gallo dispute. According to the information received by him, the Gallos went to Carlo Gambino and requested Gambino set up a commission meeting to handle the Gallo-Profaci dispute. That is unequivocally 100% not true. Bullface lie. Uh, he goes on to say, he said that Gambino then got in touch with Profaci and advised him of the approach made by the Gallows and obtained Profaci's ideas on what would be acceptable to him as commission members. The informant related that Carlo Gambino is the only one he knows who sat on the commission. Well, Profaci sits on the commission. He knew that. He stated he does not know how many members there were on the commission. But yet we go three pages back and he tells you. So how on one page, on page two, how can he say, name all the fucking members of the commission, tell you each city they're from, and then on page three, tell you the complete fucking opposite? So either he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, or he's just being wish-washy with them. And that's, this is what informants do. He related that he had heard that the first meeting of the commission was held in Florida. That's not true. And that subsequent meetings had been held in Chicago and Detroit. Uh, he doesn't mention I Atlantic City because Atlantic City was the actual first commission meeting. Not Florida. Sorry, wrong. So now we're going to get into some interesting stuff. Informant stated that the commission member who now has the state of Florida is a young man and that he obtained his position two or three years ago. The informant related that according to stories that he heard, the former commission member in Florida was not performing satisfactorily to the five family members in New York City. He stated that as a result of this, the five commission members in New York, namely Vito Genovese, like uh, Tommy Lucchese, Joe Profaci, Carlo Gambino, and Joe Bonanno. Oh, so all of a sudden he remembers Joe Bonanno. Uh, let me read this again, because uh, he stated that as a result of this, the five commission members in New York, namely Genovese, Lucchese, Profaci, Gambino, and Bonanno, invited him to New York for a conference. He stated that according to the story, they met in a hotel room in New York City, and that that was the last time the commission man from Florida was ever seen alive again. The informant related that all of this, that this is the only instance that he knows of where the commission men themselves actually 
killed an individual. He stated that the normal practice for this or for the commission is to decide that an individual has to be disposed of. And then the actual work of disposing that individual will be assigned to some member of one of several organizations. So here's why that's not true. Santo Traficante Sr. was the boss in Florida. He hands it over to his son. No one was killed from Florida. So he's blatantly lying. And he's trying to pin a murder on the commission that's not even realistic. Now, if you don't believe me, go do your research on the history of the Traficante crime family. At no time in the time period that he's talking about, which would have been 59 through 61, nobody was killed from Florida. It was Santos Traficante Sr., then Jr. The leader of the Traficante crime family was never killed, so he's lying. And like I said, all of a sudden he remembers Joe Bonanno. On page five, he couldn't remember that Joe Bonanno, oh, I can't remember the name of the other guy. But then all of a sudden he does. He's playing them. But the idea that he's trying to pin a murder on Genovese, Lucchese, Profaci, Gambino, and Bonanno is just ludicrous. Because nobody was running Florida that got killed. And discussing in the Profaci family, the informant stated that Joe Magliacco was the number two man in the Profaci family. And in the event that Profaci was disposed of, Magliacco would be the normal successor and the head of that family. He stated that Magliacco and his two brothers, Ambrose and Joey, excuse me, Ambrose and the name is redacted. Uh, he stated that Joe Magliacco's two brothers, that the two brothers held positions directly below Joe Magliacco and the Profaci family. That's not true either. His brothers were made guys, but... They're not captains. They were soldiers. If Magliaco is the number two, what's right underneath of a fucking underboss or an underboss, a consigliere? They weren't that. What's underneath a consigliere, a captain? They weren't that either. He's lying here again. So he either doesn't know what he's talking about at all or he's just lying. But it's unequivocally not true. The information furnished by this informant is, a, is unavailable from any other source. So in other words, they tried to check it out. It didn't add up. He's the only one saying that. The informant has furnished more detailed information concerning the operation of the criminal organization than has been obtained from any other source in the history. This informant, you guys are going to, and, and I, may, I may just stop here. I'll have to look at a couple of things. You're going to love this. Okay, Greg Scarpa, we know what he's gonna we know what he's gonna do. He's gonna go killing sprees. He murdered a shit ton of people. This is what the FBI memo says. And these are notes on emotional stability, reliability, and false information. You ready for this? This is signed by the director of the FBI. This informant is considered to be emotionally stable and very reliable. <laughs> Didn't Greg Scarpa get his fucking eye blown out and left the house and killed a bunch of people? <laughs> he is emotionally stable and very reliable. He has never furnished any information known to be false. I've just given you five examples of things that aren't accurate. The recommendation from the FBI is it is recommended that this informant be continued as an approved symbol informant of the New York State Office. Unreal. Simply unreal. And I'm looking at all these papers. We haven't even gotten to how much money he was making. And I'm trying to figure out. Let me go here. I'm going to this is I'm going to cover uh, one more page and then we're going to continue this next week. OK, this is the date of this is June 7th of 1962. Uh, this is an air tell. And it's to the director of the FBI, Assistant Director C.A. Evans from SAC New York. The subject, Greg Scarpa, Top Echelon Criminal Informant Program. Uh, New York Airtel from the Bureau, dated 6662. Captioned informant Gregory Scarpa is a self-admitted member of the Profaci crime family in Brooklyn, New York. Didn't they just say 
not three months ago that they he had never admitted to anything. They weren't even sure if he was involved in organized crime, but all of a sudden now he is. Captioned informant is a self-admitted member of the Profaci crime family in Brooklyn, New York. Keep in mind, 6662. He was inducted into the crime family between 1950 and 1960. This is very important. He has stated that he holds the rank of capo regime in the Profaci crime family. He was not a captain. He does not become a captain until 1977. Some 15 fucking years later or whatever the fucking case may be, he had only been an inducted member for three years at best. He does not become a capo regime until 1977. He's lying to the FBI. He's advancing his position in organized crime. And you're going to see... As we go on, and I'm just looking to see how far I, I really need to go with this today. I, I think we're going to stop right here. And there's a reason why. Let me, let me, um, let me finish what this says. Um, 6562 informant was interviewed at length concerning the criminal organizations and its operations. The following is a summary of information furnished by the informant regarding the background, the organizational setup, and the rules of the criminal organization. Informant stated that the movement had its origin in Sicily years ago, where the majority of people who were suppressed by the feudal lords was organized into Robin Hood on a Robin Hood basis. That is stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. He stated that this is typical in any di dictatorship. Um, and it just, it continues on, and we're, we're going to get to the rest of this next week. But we're going to find out that not only is he lying about his placement in the organize, in the mob, he was never he wasn't a captain until seventy fucking seven. Those are facts. Those are publicly known facts. But he's saying just two and a half years after he's a, he becomes an official inducted member into organized crime, he's a captain. Then he must have been earning an incredible amount of money, right? He must have been murdering a shitload of people, right? Because he would have been a, a highly valued man in organized crime. And up until this point, he had done nothing. But you're going to find out through his own stupidity and his own words when he starts to explain to the FBI next week that he was having a hard time rising the ranks. He couldn't get any headroom. And organized crime because you had to be known as a guy who earned money and he wasn't earning any money. And so that's why he explains to the FBI, I need money, I need money, I need money because the more money I have, the more powerful I appear. And the more powerful that I appear, the higher standing I'm going to have in organized crime. And the higher standing that I have means more information for you guys. And so what do you think the FBI does as a result? They start paying him a ton of fucking money. And so the way I want to end this today is just by saying, do you see what I mean? This is a guy who had only been in the organization a couple of years at best. He's claiming to be a captain, but yet he's telling third and fourth hand stories that he's not even getting right. And the FBI, in some cases, are trying to verify it and can't. But in most cases, they don't verify anything. They just take his word for it. Why would he lie? But this is not a man who was put into a position like other informants where they get arrested on some seri very serious charges. They're looking at 25 to life and they start ratting. This guy didn't. He chose to do it because he wanted to make money. This and, and, and there will be a skeptic who will say after hearing this, well, what's to say he just didn't say it and he was lying about everything and he did it intentionally because he knew eventually he would get money. Well, my rebuttal to that is yes, but he did have enough information that we know to be accurate. There is some stuff that he does tell that is accurate and he has to do that. He has to give them some stuff that's fucking accurate because they're going to check certain people and they already have their own base of knowledge with the top echelon informant program because they had other informants they could talk to to verify things. So he has to give them something. And if he gives them something that they could check off their list of, okay, yeah, this is, this is pretty realistic here. 
then he knows down the line he's going to be able to get away with shit and he's going to be able to pilfer their bank accounts. And some people might even brazenly say to you, well, that's not a rat. That is a fucking rat. He just gave you the commission. He gave you how it operated. He gave you the names of the leaders of the, of the five families. This is before Joe Valachi ever said a fucking word. Joe Valachi, I think it was like 63. So Scarpa had already been talking to them for two years. They already knew everything. So they knew what to ask. A lot of people have said over the years, well, it sounds to me like the FBI coached Joe Valachi. And I think that they did coach Joe Valachi to some extent. But they really didn't need to because they already had the information from Greg Scarpa. The only difference was is that Joe Valachi was a higher rank than Greg Scarpa was. Joe Valachi had been around a lot longer. So the coaching aspect and the argument of that really doesn't, it, 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 it's, it's null and void. And I know Andrew's going to hear this because this is, this is the one thing because he actually brought this up to me. It was, yeah, you know, you think maybe Velocci was coached. Of course, I think he was a lot, but I think they already knew. So it was a simple matter of saying, you know, we've heard, Joe, that there's five families. Well, yeah, that's true. We heard that it's Bonanno, Lucchese, Genovese, Profaci, Gambino, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, yes, that's true. So all he's simply doing is validating what Greg Scarpa already said. And so one of the questions I get all the time on this show is, who do you think was the worst rat ever? And I've always said that I thought that it came down to Greg Scarpa and Sammy Gravano. And I still say that. But Joe Valachi wasn't the original rat. Craig Scarpa just, you know, and, and listen, I've always known, I, I've, I've seen some of these files before. Some of them I've never seen. Craig Scarpa was the biggest fucking rat in the history of organized crime. And I'll, I'll go back to it one last time and then I'm going to get out of here. Is that the reality is People blame Valachi, then they go after Joe Bonanno. And I've gone after Bonanno myself because Bonanno went in even more great detail in his, his bullshit book, Honor and Loyalty Thy Father, whatever the fuck his book was called. Shit on my face and make me smile. Uh, who knows? Bonanno, considering where he was in the structure and his background and, and the history of Joe Bonanno and organized crime, really simplified... To Rudy Giuliani, that decrepit Nosferatu-looking motherfucker that he is, only he could have a rally outside of a dildo shop. <laughs> but Giuliani probably did not have access to these files at all. Because if he had had access to them, he wouldn't have needed to read Joe Bonanno's book or and he wouldn't have needed to have conversations with Salvatore Bill Bonanno and Joe Bonanno about this. But the way that Joe Bonanno weaved it in his book, he really sort of dumbed it down. Whereas when Greg Scarpa's talking, it's, it's very simplistic to understand, okay, there's five heads, but Joe Bonanno like really connected the dots. So it's sort of like saying, well, Greg Scarpa handed them a deck of cards Okay, but Joe Bonanno is the one that invented the glasses that could read through the back of the cards. That's the difference. Bonanno was able to simplify it to the extent and teach Giuliani how to nail them and how everything was interconnected. Greg Scarpa, if you look, just tells you who they are, what the foundation is. But you got to know more than just the foundation, and that's what Bonanno did. So they're both decrepit evil fucks for doing that. But Greg Scarpa is the worst of the worst. And part of the reason why I never did this was because of my association with somebody who actually got all of these unveiled. And some of the stuff I have, you can't get. You know, it's heavily redacted. But I have redactions where the redaction was kind of removed. So I can actually see the amount of money that this guy was making. Staggering. 20000 30000 a month for the information he was giving up. And next week, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all the money he made. And we're also going to prove to you 
the reason why he was doing this had nothing to do with revenge, had nothing to do with he was going to go to jail. It had to do with he wanted fucking money and he wanted to rise the ranks. He was incapable of earning a fucking dollar on his own. So he goes to the FBI and gets them to pay him, makes it look like he's doing all of these illegal rackets. Now he's a high earner and a high riser in the mafia. And it's been my belief, my core belief. What Greg Scarpa ultimately fucking wanted was to be the boss of a crime family and a rat at the same goddamn time. That's exactly what he was going to fucking do. So when we come back next week, we're going to do part two of the Greg Scarpa 302s. And this may be a four or five week show because I've got 300 and some pages. But what I try to do is I try to go in and just take what's relevant. So I hope you learned something today about 302s and how they work. I hope you've learned the process by which informants get involved. But of all the informants I have ever covered in any kind of way, shape, fashion, or form, I have never seen anybody so egregious Because usually it's just vindictive shit. They don't want to go to jail. You Jimmy Calandras of the fucking world. The John A. Lights of the world. The Sammy Gravanos. They don't want to go to jail. This fucker had no charges. He did it just because he's an evil fuck and he wanted money. That's not gangster. That's a bitch shit. That is bitch shit. And would I say that to Greg Scarpa's face? Probably not. I got to admit it. I probably wouldn't. He was a serial killer. Guy was a tough guy. But everybody that stands on these platforms says, oh, he was an incredible fucking earner. No, he wasn't. The FBI gave him money. That's what made him an earner. He didn't earn it on his own. He didn't go out and didn't have this swag or this truck or this racket, this loan shark and this extortion. This He didn't have any of that. He got an FBI paycheck. That's where his money came from. That's how he rises through the ranks. And as the years go by and the years go by, he begins to placate the Columbo's against each other and his whispering campaign bullshit. And we're going to get into all of that too. So come back next week uh, and let me know, do me a favor, reach out to mob talk radio show at gmail.com. Let me know what you thought about this because I guarantee a lot of you didn't know it was this severe. And so I think there's a difference between, you know, if I'm just telling you stories and I'm just saying, well, in 1962, this is allegedly what I'm, I'm reading right off their fucking, their own paperwork. You cannot refute paperwork. Yes, we can tongue and cheek it and say, well, he's probably lying about this, lying about that. I know what he's lying about and what he isn't. But some of it is going to be speculation. And I will always do my due diligence and try to tell you what I think is speculative, what is right, and what is wrong. But if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. But in just what we've went through, 40% off the bat is not true. And I've proven it to you. And if you've listened to any of my shows, you have probably heard things that I said saying, well, fuck, I remember when he did a show about Joey Gallo, that's not the way it went down. And you'd be right because it didn't. And one could make an argument that, well, maybe it's just his interpretation, but he wasn't a high level guy. He wouldn't have known certain stuff. One minute, you know, he claims that he was with Lo Cicero in all of these meetings. That wouldn't have been the case. That wouldn't have been the case. He says that Carlo Gambino had a commission meeting over Gallo and no, he didn't. That never happened. The deal between Gallo and Gambino was backdoor shit. Backdoor shit. The last thing Carlo Gambino was ever going to do is have a meeting with the guy that he is uh, trying to subvert behind the scenes. Gambino wanted, wanted Profaci fucking gone. Gambino then would want Joe Colombo gone. Because he wanted to control the Colombo crime family. It's just basic. God, he wanted to do uh, the same sort of shit years later. But the last thing Gambino was ever going to do is put crazy Joe Gallo in a commission meeting to discuss the issues between him and Profaci. And then, all because you can't control what Joey Gallo says. So you mean to tell me he's going to risk putting Gallo in the room with everybody else and have Gallo go, well, Carlo, you told me if I did this, you'd whack everybody in the fucking room. You can't control Gallo at all. Gambino thought he could, but he used the nuttiness of of Gallo to fuck with Profaci, then to fuck with Colombo. He used it to try to control the commission. 
So you mean to tell me, according to Greg Scarpa, there was a huge commission meeting and Gambino was there with Profaci and Gowell and they had this big meeting with Lo Cicero and everybody's talking about the pro- No way Gambino would have ever put himself in that situation. Never. Never. And if that meeting took place, don't you think historians would have been talking about it for the last 35 years? What do you mean to tell me? This information only came out... Uh, through FBI files back in the 90s and nobody's talked about it since and says, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. It's because it's not fucking true. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Reach out to me at mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. Thanks for hanging in. I know it's been a long show. Have a wonderful weekend. If you need anything, feel free to reach out.